Welcome to the Decentralized Finance Lecture. My name is Arthur and today we're going to introduce you to the wonderful world of decentralized finance. It's a very exciting topic um, which has basically started about three years ago. Um, it's, it's a new and emerging technology uh, that's built on blockchain, uh, smart con contract enabled blockchains in particular. And um, it really provides an uh, alternative to uh, the traditional finance domain. This course iteration of decentralized finance is based on a massive open online course uh, that I co-instructed in the fall 2021 uh, with instructors from Stanford, UIC, UC Berkeley. Uh, so as, as this, in this sense, it's uh, really a reiter reiteration of this uh, previous course. Um, however, since the MOOC was um, stretched over 13 weeks and uh, courses at Imperial are rather shorter, roughly half in size, um, you can expect that this is a condensed version of this very MOOC. So I also invite you, if you want to basically have a really an extended version of this course, and if, if this topic is so exciting to you, you can here venture to defilearning.org um, and check out the, the contents there. So you might ask, what is finance, right? Um, because we, we will dis discuss decentralized finance, so finance is certainly a, a crucial aspect of it. So what is finance? Finance is the process that involves the creation, management, and investment of money and financial assets. So it's quite broadly um, defined here, but the I think importantly, you, you should remember here the creation, the management, and investment of money and financial assets. Now, the definition of money depends on how you look at money, right? Um, it could be that money is defined by a central bank, it could be that money is defined by you who define a token, as you say, this is money, uh, or you could define, well, I can exchange my kettle, um, so my kettle is in, in a sense a form of money. So it really depends on how you want to define money or financial assets as a whole. So financial assets or financial instruments are non-physical assets in most cases whose assets, uh, who, whose, uh, whose value is derived from a contractual claim. Um, uh, they can be bank deposits, stocks, bonds, loans, derivatives, uh, and so on. And if we think of, uh, for example, cryptocurrencies, they can also be financial assets. Uh, cryptocurrencies, you can match or, or, or combine multiple cryptocurrencies together uh, to also create derivatives. Um, so these traditional financial instruments are quite important to understand to then venture into the blockchain realm where in de decentralized finance you will find very similar uh, financial assets. The financial services that are crucial in particular in the traditional finance world is uh, banking, lending and borrowing, securities, insurance, trusts and funds. Um, so overall, financial markets are really uh, places for people to, to trade financial assets. Um, so most common examples are exchanges, right? Uh, so maybe you've heard of the Nasdaq exchange or the London Stock Exchange. These are really pivotal um, components of the, of the traditional economy uh, and, and help, help um, buyers and sellers to, to meet. So what about traditional finance? So which we will refer to as CFI or centralized finance in the in the following. So you can think of traditional finance being um, kind of governed by centralized financial institutions who provide financial services. So um, as we just said, these can be banks, um, they can be uh, securities, insurance, uh, in trust, uh, trust investments, fund management companies, etc. So in these custodians, um, so we call them custodians because they hold your assets, they, they hold custody of the customer's funds. Um, in blockchains, uh, for example, if you hold a Bitcoin and you hold the Bitcoin by a so-called private key that you don't tell anyone about, then you can be considered a custodian of your Bitcoin. Uh, typically, you're not a custodian of your own uh, pounds or euros or dollars unless you put them under your pillow in your bed uh, which is maybe a good idea for some smaller amounts but probably not for larger amounts 
So the um, one of the concerns of what custodians can do is they can they can freeze accounts, right? So even if you if you think that you own um, money on, on on your bank account, uh, the bank could come about and freeze those assets if there is a there's a demand, for example, from the government for doing so. The <clears throat> the centralized financial institutions this service intermediaries for transactions as well. So if you tell tell your bank, I would like to send X pounds or dollars to the amount uh, B, then the bank can say, well, no, we won't do that. So they can send the transactions, right? That's that's the the way of of avoiding uh, that certain transactions are being done. Now, <clears throat> these intermediaries for for providing the services, they're naturally taking fees. Uh, these fees can be based on a transaction level. They can also be based on the uh, on the account level. So, for example, in Switzerland, there are uh, negative interest rates. So the banks are actually collecting negative interest on the entire account balance of of, of uh, bank accounts. Um, in the in the last decades, these CFI intermediaries have been uh, have become subject to very strict uh, and ongoing onboarding and compliance rules. So these are uh, mostly um, know your customer, so KYC, anti-money laundering, AML, and combating uh, financing of terrorism regulations, CFT. Um, and these are certainly very, very crucial. Um, and and banks are, are really um, kind of gearing up to, to always comply with the latest regulations. Um, and these are also being updated, especially with the uh, advent of cryptocurrencies. Banks are are quite strict on on particular, on particularly money that's not KYC or not AML. They will probably close your bank account if you if you have um, if you have enough crypto money that you suddenly want to to send to your bank account, um, so which is which is very normal because regulations apply. So. In the bank, a customer has no typically no privacy, so the service providers knows about your real identity. They know about your full account balance. They know about all of your transactions, uh, uh, including amount, time, and and send. Uh, I mean, recipient of the transactions and also sender. So if you receive money from third parties. So overall, the CFI system can be described as rather opaque, uh, a silhouette um, database. And we don't know that much about the, the contents there. So obviously we need to have a trusted to operate. We have we, we need to have banks and, and centralized intermediaries to be trusted to to operate correctly and securely in that regard. So this gave you a very high level understanding of what CFI is. And um, we could say that with the event of Bitcoin um, and its uh, white paper in 2008, first and then the associated code released in the beginning of 2009 um, there's really like a new advent of, um, of financial systems and how to how to exchange financial assets uh, digitally in particular how this came about um, I might want to add that obviously Bitcoin is is a breakthrough however there have been many many works prior to that by for example Nick Zabo uh, and others, David Shaw, etc., on eCash, um, that led ultimately to to Bitcoin. So the the um, the um, the uh, science, I mean, science often extends at the boundaries of what's possible, of what's known to be possible. Um, so this is certainly a culmination of all these efforts of many of of decades of of work of many very smart people. Um, so. In 2009, then, Satoshi Nakamoto, which we, by the way, don't know who it is, so it could be a male, it could be a female, it could be anyone, it could be a group, um, so we don't really know what kind of, um, what kind of pseudonym or, um, or entity really there is, there is behind there. We have no idea. Um, but Satoshi Nakamoto wrote this white paper, uh, Peer-to-Peer Electronic Cash System, so you can still... Uh, look at this white paper on bitcoin.org slash bitcoin.pdf. It's certainly something I can recommend you to have a look at. It explains um, how uh, blockchain would operate, how how um, 
our proof of work blockchain would operate. It's uh, rather short. It's just a few pages. It's uh, really not that much in the in the traditional um, academic style, writ written in the academic style. But it's it's uh, it's groundbreaking and it has many very forward looking ideas. It has the it already contains the ideas of program programmable transactions, so smart basic smart contracts. Um, it contains ideas about uh, how to make sure that lightweight clients or mobile phones can actually uh, part partake in the in the Bitcoin network without having the full copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so it's really, really forward looking uh, in many regards um, and uh, very beautiful how, how short it is in, in essence. With Ethereum um, uh, came about then the, the birth of a more general purpose smart contract platform. So Ethereum by itself did not innovate much on the net on the consensus layer part. So it basically uh, forked or took over uh, a similar proof of work blockchain to Bitcoin. Um, where it did change, however, is on how transactions are being specified and and designed. Right. So you can um, you can basically deploy so-called smart contracts and these smart contracts they are like entities and you can interact with them so you can send transactions towards them and they will do something with your financial assets and then they may send you something back um, so that's really um, it kind of facilitated uh, programmable money right so in in bitcoin it was always possible to to uh, program to have transactions that that uh, execute a certain program which is specified in the language script. However, uh, that's almost like writing assembly, so it's rather complicated. Um, whereas Ethereum really simplified that process and made it much, much more flexible for people to, um, to innovate on the financial asset front. And this is so crucial for, for DeFi as a whole. So I've mentioned DeFi so often and you might just ask me now, okay, but what is DeFi? What is decentralized finance? Well, DeFi uh, really stands for a financial infrastructure uh, that's built on open, permissionless, highly interoperable um, blockchains. Uh, it has a protocol stack that is built on public smart contracts, right? So like Ethereum or other smart contract enabled blockchains. And uh, we, can, we can find a lot of... Uh, kind of analogies to the traditional finance or centralized finance, as you can see here. So there are a variety of different um, uh, instruments or, or, or concepts of the centralized finance domain that, that do translate over to the DeFi domain. So, and to really help you to define, to better define what DeFi is, we have designed here this um, um, uh, decision tree. Um, so, and the, the decision tree starts here at the, at the very top. So you can, you can start here and you can ask yourself. So for example, are the financial assets controlled by the user? So if you, as a user, are you custodian, right? Of, of your own assets. So is it a non-custodial solution? So is there, is there the lack of a centralized entity that actually holds the asset? If that's the case, um, and then you might ask, Okay, can someone single-handedly censor transaction execution? So is there any intermediary that has the power and authority to, to choose to censor transaction execution? If that's not the case, then can someone single-handedly censor the protocol execution? Right here, the, the entire protocol execution. Can this be uh, kind of censored by, a, by an authority? If that's not the case, then we are in a, in a space which we could call the pure DeFi domain. Right? So this is really where um, that's the definition of DeFi uh, as we would like to have it. Now, um, as many things in life, uh, things are not black and white. So there are a lot, lot of shades of gray of, of DeFi basically um, um, between CeFi and DeFi. So if we start at the very first again, so if we have a custodian, then we just know directly, all right, okay, that's CeFi, right? There's no, uh, there's no DeFi concept per se. Now, if we go to, a, um, if, if somebody can, can, I mean, if it's non-custodial, but somebody can single-handedly send the transaction, then we could say, well, it's a CeFi intermediary, so it's a centralized financial intermediary, but the settlement of the assets themselves is still non-custodial. 
and that's why we have a DeFi settlement. And here the last uh, hybrid is kind of uh, something where we have uh, a DeFi protocol, but somebody has somehow some admin rights, right? Uh, to to actually censor some transaction. And this is where we what we call a centrally governed DeFi. So governance mechanisms are quite important in DeFi as a whole, as we will see also in this lecture later on. Um, so protocol governance, the question of how to manage protocol governance is, is really key uh, to understand whether something is decentralized or not. So we have <clears throat> custody and settlement, transaction execution, and protocol governance. So three properties that help to define uh, what DeFi really is. So I hope this gave you a very good uh, initial introduction of DeFi. Um, we're going to explore many more concepts that, that are in DeFi, uh, that exist in DeFi, uh, along with uh, guest lecturers that are really uh, specialized in their fields and, and, and brilliant by themselves. So uh, let's dive into the, the next lecture right along.